Chapter 218 Promise After Charlie and the two official Beyonders departed Rue Anashi, Lumian settled back down at the wooden table, berating himself internally. How could I forget? I mustn't gaze upon what I ought not to. The same applied to observing luck. Previously, he believed that scrutinizing one's luck was a subtle affair, unlikely to be detected. Neither a sequence 7 Franca nor the equivalent of a sequence 7 Black Scorpion Roger had noticed anything awry. However, the previous official Beyonder had displayed an unmistakable reaction. Does his sequence far exceed mine, or does he possess special abilities, or perhaps he wields a corresponding mystical item? Lumian struggled to determine. He had never observed Beyonders beyond sequence 7, lacking a point of comparison. Whether it was Gardner Martin or Mr. K, he exercised caution and refrained from examining their luck in their presence. Having taken note of the lesson, Lumian, who didn't require sleep, perused the copied grimoire of Aurore. The sunlight grew more intense, transforming the window into a radiant source. Even the bustling Ruanashi appeared like a golden oil painting. In comparison to Backlin, the capital of the Lowen Kingdom, Treyar remained bathed in sunlight. Despite its pollution, the city's industrial layout was relatively sensible, confining the impact to specific areas. Most of it lay to the south, where factories were abundant. Knock, knock, knock. Someone rapped on room 207 once again. Yet this time, Lumian failed to discern any footsteps. Arching his right eyebrow, he stowed away the papers on the table and turned toward the door. Come in. It's unlocked, Madame Red Boots. With a creak, the door swung open, and Franca stepped inside, donning a blouse, beige trousers, and red boots. In surprise, she inquired, How did you know it was me? Why ask the same question as Jenna? Should I praise her for being a worthy student of an assassin like you? Lumion replied, amused. Because I possess a brain. Don't make it sound like I lack one, Franca responded calmly, settling herself on Lumion's bed. Lumion chortled. I can't think of anyone else capable of approaching my room without my notice and knocking on the door politely. Naturally, he had to exclude Madame Magician first. She lacked such diligence. It was impressive enough that she managed to reply in time. After a brief moment of contemplation, Lumion inquired, Has Jenna's predicament been resolved? Franca clicked her tongue. You have an uncanny foresight, brat. She assumed the role of an elder sister. It's a rather straightforward deduction. Lumian displayed a disdainful expression for explanation. If Jenna is still in danger, how could you, Hidden Blade, find a composure to seek me out? Franca laughed dryly. I was referring to your astute guess that the authorized Beyonders would primarily investigate whether Jenna and the others are followers of evil gods. After all, I am closer to an evil god than any evil god believer here. Lumian raised his right hand and gently patted his left chest. With a smile, he responded. Such insights stem from the ample experiences of a wanted criminal. You seem quite proud, Franca teased. Curious, Lumian inquired. How did the authorized Beyonders conduct their investigations? The more he learned, the more confident he would become in evading similar inquiries in the future. Franca responded with an air of indifference. Based on Jenna's account, I reckon they utilized the powers of a notary. Each person had to sign a pledge of their faith, a pledge witnessed by a notary. <laughs> Those who lied were engulfed in burning golden flames. They bled profusely and were dragged away. Aware that Lumion was still delving into the realm of mysticism, Franca proceeded to provide a detailed explanation. Notary-related abilities are quite common in Treyar. They can be found in various places, disguised under different guises. Notaries have the ability to create contracts with mystical effects. Once the parties have fixed their signatures to a similar contract in the presence of a notary, they are bound by it, unless they are demigods. Even at the demigod level, breaking the contract requires a substantial price. For transactions involving millions, or even tens of millions, of Vaudois, both parties are willing to pay a hefty sum and receive notarization in front of the God of Deeds' sacred emblem at a cathedral. The pledge is a special contract. 
The eternal blazing sun is also known as the god of deeds and the guardian of businesses. It aligns with Aurori's grimoires, Lumion inquired. Has Jenna returned home? Franca nodded subtly. She needed to catch up on sleep. Franca scrutinized Lumion. You seem lively. I can't tell that you haven't slept all night. I'm accustomed to it. Lumion couldn't reveal that his condition would automatically restore itself at 6 in the morning. You also appear quite energetic. Franca smirked and replied, I'm accustomed to it as well. For people like us, the night is the beginning of revelry. If Aurore had made that statement, words like inspiration, drafts, and tranquility of the night would have crossed Lumion's mind. However, when Franca said it, he could only associate it with orgies, large beds, and romping. Unaware of his critical thoughts, Franca continued, Apprentice training at Theatre de la Anza and Queja Pigeons will be suspended for three days. The theatre will be temporarily occupied by the police headquarters. The daily performances will carry on as usual to avoid impacting the national convention elections. However, the repertoire will be adjusted. Some plays have lost their female leads. Charlotte and my Pumea are gone, Lumian asked. Though he had suspected that Susanna Matisse hadn't been completely purified when Charlie left with the official Beyonders, he still felt a tinge of disappointment upon hearing Franca's account. Franca nodded. Apart from them, two others are missing, the real Ive and Lolth. Among the remaining actors and apprentices, a total of seven have converted to the Mother Tree of Desire. They were exposed, but it seems none of them received any boons. So those who received boons have fled, while the mere believers have been abandoned. Lumion scoffed inwardly as he relayed Charlie's departure with the suspected official beyonders to Franca. Franca let out a soft sigh. This is the best outcome for him. We can't protect him every single day. Though the official beyonders can't either, they can arrange for Charlie to stay in a relatively safe place until Susanna Matisse's matter is truly resolved. In comparison... You're in more danger. Didn't you mention that Susanna Matisse holds a grudge against you? Evil spirits can be quite fixated. That will give me a good chance to test Mr. K's finger, Lumian silently muttered, indicating that he would be cautious. Something crossed his mind and he inquired, Do you know why our Savoy mob supports Hugh's Artoy? Franca smiled. If I had that figured out, I wouldn't be part of the Savoy mob anymore. Hmm... Is that her primary reason for joining the Savoy mob? Lumian pondered. Franca stretched, stood up, and addressed him. We truly have a chance to acquire Theatre de la Anza and Keja Pigeons at a low price, but we might have to face the enmity of those Scrooges. However, you have nothing to fear. Yes, I'll go to Rue de Fontaines to discuss with Gardner and resolve my problem while there. What problem? Lumian was puzzled. Franca responded with a smile. Even though the desires Rentas evoked were suppressed by the mysticism smelling salts, my body still feels a bit restless. When I recall that sensation, I feel somewhat empty, longing for fulfillment and release. Since you can't help me, I have no choice but to find my true lover. Why aren't you affected at all? There were indeed residual effects, but I was fine after six in the morning. Lumian pursed his lips and replied, My willpower is stronger than yours. Franca sneered, walked towards the door and exited room 207. Lumian watched her leave, deep in thought. Has Franca become the boss's mistress, or has the boss become Franca's lover? Is Franca responsible for satisfying the boss, or is the boss responsible for satisfying Franca? Just before noon, Charlie returned to Albert's du Coq d'Oray, he packed his meager belongings into his suitcase and descended the stairs with it. Spotting Lumion on the second floor, he glanced around and lowered his voice. I have a new job and need to move elsewhere. After some time, I should be able to return to the basement bar for a drink. Lumion smirked once again. Sounds good. If Susanna Matisse's issue could truly be resolved, Charlie's fate would change. Charlie also seemed pleased. He pondered for a moment and stated, there are many things I can't tell you, but when the time comes, I'll try to drop hints for you. In the Inquisition beneath Eglise St. Robert, 
He had come across Ciel's wanted poster and recognized his friend. Yet he didn't inform Deacon Francois. What does that mean? Why does Charlie suddenly feel he can be useful? Does his new job have a close connection to the official Beyonders, allowing him to gather valuable information? Lumian swiftly formed the hypothesis. With a mischievous grin, he remarked, First, focus on staying alive before contemplating anything else. I might leave the market district in a few weeks. The implication of his words was, Do your job well, and don't even think about leaking information. Don't attempt it unless your life is truly at stake. Whether Charlie understood or not, Lumion wasn't entirely certain. After all, this guy wasn't very smart. After spending the afternoon at Sao de Balbris, Lumion changed into a grayish-blue worker's uniform and donned a dark blue cap. He hailed a public carriage to take him to Rue de Pavis in Cartier du Jatin Botanique. As per his arrangement with Louis Lund, Lumion anticipated a response from Madame Poilis regarding their meeting before the night fell. Upon reaching the lobby of apartment 9, Lumion opened the letterbox in room 302, only to find a collection of flyers inside. The letter hasn't arrived? Lumion suppressed his anxiety and decided to wait across from apartment 9. Just as he exited the lobby and descended the stairs to the roadside, he noticed a brown four-wheeled carriage approaching him from a distance. It came to a halt right in front of him. The carriage driver had jet black hair and piercing blue eyes. He sported dark red attire, yellow trousers, a polished hat, and a white cravat. It was Louis Lund. In the next instant, the carriage door swung open noiselessly, revealing the figure of a woman seated within.